Heat. 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 We include them all together because they all are connected in some way. Of course, they're all bound in the head. But the eyes are connected to the nose. Do you know that? No. Yeah, every time you cry, when you create tears, actually, not just when you cry, you're it's always creating tears, they flow from up here across the eye down to here in the medial aspect. And there's a little tiny duct right there where the tears constantly flow into. And that flows into the nasal lacrimal canal, which flows into your nose. So when you be crying, like when you cry real, real hard, and you start like forming mucus, is that part of like, it? I, I was doing that last night. Oh, man. So I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Oh my gosh. But that is? Yeah, that's why all that mucus comes oh out. It's really gosh. running. Because not only is there a lot of extra fluid going in there, but it's an osmotic fluid, which means it creates um, that osmotic pull, that osmotic force that causes mucus producing cells to have more water sucked into them, which causes them to swell up and create more mucus. But it's very, very runny. Uh, normally, you don't even notice that your tears are flowing into your nose because they flow backwards and go into your throat, which means your nose is connected to your throat. So that's how your eyes and your nose and your throat are all connected. So what about the ear? Well, that picture that I had up there, I should probably put it back up here again. Sure. From this video. You see this right here? Yeah. This is called the nasal, oh, I'm sorry, this is called the eustachian tube. Yeah. Now, that eustachian tube is actually connected from the middle ear to the throat. This tube goes from the middle ear to the throat. In adults, it is long and more vertical. In children, it is short and more horizontal. Now, considering all of the bacteria that we have in our mouth, all the viral particles that we have in our nose and our mouth, you can imagine that it would be an easy trip for those to go up a child's eustachian tube and then hang out right in here. Ear infection. Which is going to cause a ear infection. Wow. That's why, you know, when you have young kids like toddlers, kids just over toddlers, yeah. they either have an ear infection, they just got over an ear infection, or they're about to get an ear infection okay. for those first several years of their life. That's how they live. So this is because of this short eustachian tube that they have as with an EU. As we get older, that eustachian tube gets longer and more vertical, which means it's less likely for those things to make their way up, which is why we don't have that problem. When we have an ear infection, it's usually the external auditory canal, which people call swimmer's ear. Hmm. Now, imagine if there's a whole bunch of bacteria right there causing an infection. An infection is going to cause what? Or what's the body going to do? Inflammation. Inflammation. And what follows inflammation? Edema. Swelling, edema, which is going to put pressure on that eardrum. Mm. So when we look inside that kid's ear, we can actually see the light reflecting off that eardrum differently because instead of the eardrum like this, it's more like this. Yeah. And that's why that kid is crying, just doing yeah. this all the time. Yeah, I have a question. So sometimes, if this kid is prone to this happening all the time, over and over, they will make a little incision right here and put in what they call a tube. It's actually more of a ring. Yeah, it's it's not like a tube tube. Um, that is called a meringeotomy. They're going to put that in there. That fluid's going to drain right out there. It's going to release that pressure. But that's what you hear when you hear, well, that's what they mean when you hear kids having tubes placed in their ears. That's it's reason. only temporary. It's only yes, going to they'll fall the out and then oh, oh, oh. they'll fall out on their own. And then that'll heal up. Oh. Yeah. You know, as an adult, you don't want to cut this. Because it's already like broken. Right. So when you was like this and like this, what would what you describe? No, I was saying, the normally the eardrum's like this. But if there's swelling on the other side of it, it's going to be 
course this uh, way. Like more like that. So that's why when we're looking at kids here, we can see that. The light mm -hmm. reflecting off of it this way towards you. Going. Instead of away from you like this. Towards you like this. Away from you. Like pushing through a balloon versus out. Yeah. Bulging. Yes. Um, so when I was little, I had a lot of ear issues. Um, so I have two questions. What is it when... <laughs> like I had a lot of ear issues. I had a lot of ear infections. There, I remember there being a portion where like I would have to walk even through school. I'd have to have cotton balls in my ears. Like what? What would have caused that? I guess like what in your experience mm. would that issue be? That was very common when people would have ear infections. Put cotton in their ears, and all it does is sort of help do a couple of things. One, it helped to collect fluid and fluid that might be dripping out. If there was a room you might need two, it could decrease the likelihood of more pathogens getting in. Three, just sort of helps contain some heat. Gotcha. But that's it. So then my Maybe next pull question. Out some aspirin comes with. Um, I did have a meringeotomy. That's yeah. meringeotomy, right? I did have one of those. Um, and I remember one of my tubes coming out. But then the other one I never saw, never, you know, I think the doctor at one point said it was back there, but Maybe they were expecting place. it to come out. Yeah, exactly. So back in September when they were doing all those tests on me, um, she was putting me in the machine and she was like, she came back out asking if I had any piercings anywhere because somewhere on this side of my head, like something was showing up in the, in the x-ray or in the scan. And I like had her check, I had no earrings in or anything. Could that have been one of the tubes? Oh, like, well, maybe. That's a possibility they can get stuck in there? I suppose so. And what, like, what kind of complications would lead from that? Probably anything from infection to nothing. Huh. So I don't know. I think that's just always been in the back of my mind. I'm like, I probably have a tube well, like, in my... Been in the side of your head, too. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I wonder if she like saw my tube in my ear I don't or something. Know, that's weird. Is it true that insects get in our ears? Well, uh, they do sometimes, um, but they get stopped by this. That's a dead end. Even if there was a hole here, it would get stopped here. If anything, it would go down to the throat. But it wouldn't, oh, do, that. That. But it wouldn't do that. It would get stopped here. And in fact, um, a lot of times, it's not common for a bug to get in the ear. One of the, one of the things that we want, hold on a second. One of the things that we do, and bug gets in, don't you do it, have taken off ER, have them do it, is we'll pour rubbing up on their ears. So we'll tilt their head this way, mm -hmm. and we pour rubbing up on their ear and kill whatever's in there. Because we have to go in with some tiny little forceps and grab it and pull it out. Those videos, it's and it, it is a biting insect, bless you, or a stinging insect, and you start grabbing on it with forceps, with tweezers, it could bite or sting or grab on, and now that hurts the patient. Meanwhile, you have pointed things right there. If they suddenly flinch their head, that could be a problem. So we want to kill it first. Uh, and that's this is one of the only times you want to pour rubbing up on your ear. Yeah, don't, don't do that. And again, that's why I say you don't do that. Bring it to somebody else to do that. But they do not crawl to the brain. That is. I forget where I saw it. I saw one video. And this guy like admitted to the ER with he was just screaming and nobody knew why. And he was just going, ah, ah. Yeah. And he couldn't like control himself or like form a sentence or anything. He just kept screaming. And then they found out there was a bug in his ear. And they finally yeah. took it out and he suddenly leveled out and was able to talk again and everything. Yeah, so it was literally just busted here all the time. Nobody wants that. No. So what was your question, Smile? Where's the middle? Where's the inner? No, I'm saying like where is outside of the ear? Outside is coming this way. Okay, okay, okay. So this would be here, and as I go this way, my tree would go more and more and more and more and more. Now what do we know about openings into the body? Anywhere we have an opening, what do we make? Mucus. Mucus. What does mucus do? Protection. Protection. Any bacteria passes it. Keeps things out. How? Keeping it out. How? It traps it's it. Yeah, sticky. So what traps property does mucus have? Sticky. Or sticky. Well, we have something like that in our ears. Ear we cerumen. create it here, along here. It's called cerumen, or you can call it earwax. And as you talk or chew, it moves it more and more and more and more and more and more, and more, and more, and more to the outside. Makes sense. 
And as it moves, it picks up more serum and more wax, as well as any debris, pathogens, etc. Moves it more and more towards the outside. Just like a snowball going down the hill, picks up more snow, but also picks up dirt and twigs and moves it. This is why we say don't get a Q-tip and jam it in there because you're doing two things. One, you're jamming it right back in. And then two, you can create little abrasions, little cuts. And now you have an opening. This is what bacteria like. It's exactly what they're open for. So you don't want to do that. Hmm. But that's what smoothing does. It is a type of protection just like you just anywhere else. You can just jump on in. Now, I know sometimes people will say use hydrogen peroxide to clean your ears. Do not use hydrogen peroxide to clean your ears. Hydrogen peroxide has been shown, um, it's been proven that it does not decrease bacterial load. We still use it for wound debridement. And we use it in the mouth uh, when you have like baking soda, hydrogen peroxide, toothpaste, that's fine. But what happens in, in the ear, if it comes in contact with catalase, it's going to dissociate into oxygen and water. So the oxygen will diffuse up and the water will be stuck there, which means now you have a warm, moist environment, which is exactly what bacteria like. So don't do that. Now, if a doctor does it, that's different because they might be using it as a debridement, but you don't do it. And if you actually damage healthy cells, you don't want that to happen. So it's that lacrimal gland that creates the tears. It's over here. I'm sorry? How do you spell it? Serumen. With a C. C E R. And a D. And an R. Yes. And then it's U-M-E-M. C-E-R-U-M-E-M. 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 Not E-U. Here, right here. C-E-R-U-M-E-M. I'm sorry? Once the comes The car uncle is that little uh, red triangular area, the medial aspect of your eye, oh. where you wake to sleep out in the morning. Nicole. That little red triangle right there, it's just called the car uncle. Hmm. The conjunctiva, this is something that uh, you've probably not heard of, but you, I'm sure you've heard of conjunctivitis. Yes. Conjunctivitis is of the conjunctiva. Gotcha. So let's see if I can find the conjunctiva. Okay. So if you look here, see this pink? Mm -hmm. Right down here, this line. Oh, like inside your water. It comes right here, mm -hmm. underneath your eyelid, and it stops right here at the cornea. Wow. And then it comes from here. This is why if you put a contact lens in, it's not going to slip behind your eye. This dead ends here. Because of that conjunctiva. Mm, okay. And the conjunctiva stop. stops right here at the cornea. That's where that's where hair and stuff be located and all that. Yeah, it's not going to get past this point. That's why you can always you catch. You won't go back here yet. Conjunctiva. Conjun. It sounds so like Japanese. It's not. It's actually something other than Japanese. Conjunctiva. <laughs> Thin, delicate, transparent, mucous membranes, blah, blah, blah. The sclera. Okay, if you look at an eyeball, first of all, what shape is it? An eyeball is oval. It's more round, actually. If you look at an eyeball and you pop it out, it's actually much more round. Wow. Wait, I saw a picture. Look. It's more yeah. round. A sphere, like I thought you meant like yeah, but I mean either way. So this white part, what you call the whites of your eyes, is called the sclera. And the thing about your sclera is, if you look at somebody's eyes, you can only see a small portion of it, but it actually makes up the entire rest of the eyeball. You just don't see it. You'd have to pop it out of their head. And please do not do that. 
you will go to prison. I just saw one um, documentary on the square on the most handsome the most handsome there's a it's a Netflix show. I'm actually going to just tell you what it is because it, it, it has multiple episodes and each episode has like individual things in it. One of them was like the most handsome gorilla or whatever. And they were like breaking it down as to why people thought he was like that even though he looks like a normal gorilla. And it was saying they were like because he has an increased sclera, like being able to be seen than really? most gorillas. And because humans can see more of the whites of his eyes. They are just more attracted to him because they can relate to him better, which is not, really not weird. attractive. Attractive, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Just like that, they think he's a handsome gorilla. Gotcha. Which I thought was pretty interesting. That's weird. Yeah, like most gorillas don't. It's but but not it's a lot true of because we all have um, we get we get get any animal, and and they do that with dogs, right? Don't they have like an ugliest dog contest? <laughs> so you can do that with animals, and you can decide, you know, which. In which one do you think is the best looking of the species? Mm -hmm. or, uh, and the reality is, um, it's really incredibly subject subjective. But there are those little tiny clues that make somebody think this dog is cuter than that dog. Yeah. Sometimes they think the ugly is cute. Thankfully, that's how I got a girlfriend once. <laughs> now, if you look at uh, the cornea. Don't they have a mom? The cor so I know I'm messing with you. The cornea <laughs> is part of the eyeball here. Can look at the this part right here is the cornea. The part where... And the thing about the cornea, see how it bulges out? Yes. Now the cornea is actually clear. So when you look at somebody's eyes straight on, you're looking right through the cornea. You can't see it. But if you looked at it from the side, you can see that it bulges out. And you can definitely see this on animals. Like dogs or cats, you look at the side of their eyeball. Mm -hmm. You can see it sort of bulges. There's that bulge, but it's clear. That's the cornea. Now, there is some unique things about the cornea. For instance, there's no blood supply to the cornea. That makes sense. Well, that means how does it get nutrients? Is it plasma? No. Something through. Wait. The tears that come across this way. But also, there's a fluid behind it called the aqueous humor. Oh. And that's how it gets most of its nutrients. Does that acre stays there all the time? Yes and no. Because it's constantly being made. Okay. So there's a constant flow of it there, but there's a constant drain of it as well. Mm -hmm. For new. For new. And here's the thing about that aqueous humor. See these areas right here? Mm -hmm. The aqueous humor is actually made here. It's made from the ciliary body. It's not labeled. Oh, there it is. Ciliary body. The ciliary body is what actually makes the aqueous humor. Constantly makes it. So here's what happens. And this surprises people. Because that fluid flows up here through your pupil. Your pupil is just a big open space. It's a window. And then that fluid fills up this space and then drains out here through a trabecular mesh, uh, meshwork and a canal we call the Canal of Schlem. Because if you're going to name a canal, name it after Schlem. But this is important because it keeps that constant pressure here. So it keeps that constant shape of the cornea. That fluid. That fluid, that aqueous humor. And I say that's important because if that fluid is constantly created, then it has to constantly drain. If it doesn't constantly drain, that's going to increase pressure back there which is going to change the way light comes in, which is going to cause a type of blindness. Hmm. We call that condition glaucoma. That's what glaucoma wow, is. Okay. Glaucoma is when this aqueous humor is flowing up through here, but, but it's right. not draining correctly. And that's common, right? It is. Yeah, that's and what we test so much for. Older. Typically as you get older. Well, yeah, obviously. It it's produced and drained on both sides. No, that's, that's, that's what, what I'm one. saying. Well, it's produced and produced. This is, remember, you're, this is, you're seeing a slice of it. Yes. So it's all the way around. Mm -hmm. So it's constantly being produced, constantly flowing through your pupil. And then out here, the iris. The iris is the colored part, right? So it's flowing through your pupil and filling this up. What that means is you're seeing me through fluid right now. Yes. As light comes through here and it passes through the pupil and 
through the lens and scattered back this way onto the retina where the little switches are located. The switches are activated or not activated, and all that information gets sent to the optic nerve. It goes back here, crosses over partially, and then back to the occipital lobe of the brain where it's interpreting its vision. So that's, so you know how we take a picture. Yes. That's why that little, little shiny part that we always see is like the liquid, the transparent liquid inside Actually, of the Actually, no, that's more towards back here. Okay, okay. What do you the mean? You see, right you see, you see, you see, all right, you see that picture, all right, you take a picture. Oh, you, you mean the glare? Yeah, the, okay. Yeah. It's actually from the lens and behind that. Oh, so I got to yeah. the, the transparent. Okay. No, and actually, interestingly, um, as light comes through here and goes through here and goes through here and goes back on the retina, activates those switches. And that's what creates the signal of what we see. There are several types of animals that have another membrane where the light comes through, goes through that membrane, so those switches, bounces off, and then bounces back that's on the switches again. The color. Which is why their eyes glow at night, which is why most of the types of animals that can see really well at night, because they're basically seeing everything twice. Because the information is coming in, it's hitting those switches, bounce off, and it's coming back into them again. But then when you take their flashlight or something and you shine it on their lights, those animals, their, like their eyes just glow. Like um, like an alligator at night. If you shine lights out, you can just see their eyes glowing. So there's like all of that extra little membrane. And it's, it's inside. Good things to know. One, the cornea does not have any blood supply. What that means is, it doesn't really have much of an immune response either. Oh, okay. So if some organism was to get there, it could survive off of the nutrients without having to put up much of a fight. You said what was the thing? Organism. You're talking a microscopic organism, correct? Well, not, not necessarily. Like... Because there's a worm. A parasite oh, yeah. called Loa Loa. Oh, the African eyeworm. Oh. Lo right? Loa Loa. I'm not going there. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, lots of things. The Loa Loa. Loa Loa, the cherry band crop guide, dragon calls, manhances. Those are all parasites. Are those Wait, so when you possibly. so when you get something in your eye, like an eyelash or like a small like shading of something, when your eye waters, to get, that helps to get it out, though, yeah, right? That's the idea. But so you're you're saying that it's not microscopic, so no, this is coming in this way. Oh, that's where the worm is. Yeah. I don't like that. He wants to get here. Oh, in the middle All right, part, we can go ahead and do that then. Let's get where this nutrients are here. Oh, you see so that. there could be a worm just slipping around back there. Yeah, I kind of thought I saw one earlier too. I was uh, feeling it, you know. Yeah. I was like, I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> just do this. Helps a little bit. Well, well, <laughs> well actually, um, the iris you can see here. This is the colored part. Here's up your eye. The oh, pupil okay. makes up the colored part of your eye. The pupil is just here. It's just an opening. Is that not, is the pupil the black? Yeah. Okay. But That's it's not black. Sure. The pupil isn't black. It's just non-colored? There's nothing, or there. there's nothing there. Yeah. It's black. Uh, <laughs> what causes your pupil to dilate? Oh, shut on, Josh. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think, Go ahead. Man, I guess. Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, what the hell? Um, you can't you cannot dissect an eyeball and cut the pupil out and hold a pupil in your hand and say, here, look at those dark circles of pupil. Well, yeah, There's nothing there. It's just an opening. It's like if you went over and opened up that door. Visually, it is the, the doorway part. is just an opening, right? Now, why is it black? Have you ever no looked inside of a dark cave or a tunnel on a bright sunny day, stood outside, and all it looks like is a dark hole in the wall, or go into a, open up a door to a bar that's dark in the middle of the daylight, yes. or in a basement that's in the middle of the day, there's no light down there, all you see is black? Mm -hmm. That's what you're seeing here. You're looking into a big black space. There's no light in there. So that's why it looks dark. 
Now, if we need more light to get in, what will happen is this will relax right here, and that will cause the iris to dilate like Which this. Which one? The canal? No, not the canal. Oh, there's the canal some. I didn't realize they even knew. I didn't realize they even This right here, the iris part. The one that produces the... Um... The iris doesn't produce it, the ciliary body produces it. Okay. So the iris itself can relax and go like this, which make that opening bigger. Does that mean the iris light, becomes smaller? Which will allow more light to come in. If the iris constricts, the pupil becomes smaller this way. If there's too much light coming in. So, so if I get a pen light, a flashlight, and I go with your eye right now and I shine it right in your eye, what I expect to see is the pupils go like this. If they don't, that tells me there's a problem. Something's not reacting like it should be. Um, if you go into that dark place, your pupil should relax and dilate so as to allow for as much light to come in as possible. But then the tra there is a transition time after that. As soon as you walk in, the pupil will go like yeah, this. Exactly. But it'll take some time before mm -hmm. those switches get activated. Now, here's the thing that you probably didn't know, because you know I like telling you things you probably didn't know. This is why a pirate would wear a patch over one of their eyes. Because if they were boarding a ship that they were taking over in the daylight, when they'd go down below cabins, it was dark down there. So if they walked out from the sunlight and went below deck, there could be somebody just standing there with a sword going, That's true. Wait for them to get there. That's well, the sound a sword makes. You mean something so, like or a gun. So, <laughs> If they have a patch over one of their eyes, as soon as they go below deck, they can take the patch off, and now this eye would be accommodated to the lack of light. So it would already be ready to see everything yeah. much more clearly. Wow. There's a reason why they would wear a patch. I just always thought it was because they had attacked by sharks. Yeah. Okay. So there's a reason why they would wear a patch. I just always thought it was because they had attacked by sharks a lot or something. Yeah. <laughs> or fashion. No, I really thought they were blind well, or something. Actually, they had to get initiated. I thought because they were pirates. Because they were pirates. I thought, I guess, because they were pirates and they were so unhealthy that maybe like something happened to their eyes. Mm -hmm. and and they were just they were yeah. common, yeah. But no, the so what, what are legs? Anything like that? What are legs and a hook? Yeah, hook. Yeah. 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 Clearly, it wasn't good. Explain this. I have a question. Okay. Oh, so yeah. So I'm about to ask you. So is the iris? You said the iris. It doesn't get thick. The iris itself can relax. Which will cause the pupil to relax. My dreams. Maybe trying to get hopped up on medications right now. Right. Yeah. Hold on just a second. Look, look up here on the screen, right behind the pupil. This is the lens. Now, a lens acts just like a lens, like a lens in glasses, like a lens in a microscope, a lens in a telescope. It's made of these protein structures. It's fairly solid. If you were to ever dissect an eyeball and you felt a lens, you'd be surprised how solid it is. But there's little tiny ligaments here attached to it from the ciliary body that can actually pull and cause it to change its shape. What? And that there's little <laughs> ligaments here that attach to the lens that cause it to pull can kind of change its shape, which is going to redirect how the light hits back here in the rest of the eyeball. Just a moment. That's where we find the retina. The retina is the place with all the switches. This way. Here. There's a little low. Okay, so you see the lining right here uh, in red as the retina. And what they did was they took the cut right here and enlarged it. So light comes in through the cornea, through the fluid through the opening pupil, through the lens, gets scattered back here, and then it hits these cells here. These are the switches. They're either activated or they're not activated. It's good, but they look like switches. You'll notice these little switches, these cells have a shape that looks like a rod, or some of them have sort of a cone shape to them. The ones that look like rods are called rods, uh -huh. and the ones that look like cones 
are it's called cones. And the rods are uh, very easy to activate. You only need one photon of light to activate one of these cells. Mm -hmm. A photon of light is kind of like saying a molecule of light, even though light doesn't travel in molecules, but meaning that that's how small it is. And all you need is one to activate this. So they're very, very sensitive. But they're only good for like grays, blacks, whites, and basic shapes. The basic shapes. ones that you see often. Basic shapes, yes. Mm. The cones are more specific for colors and for uh, detail. This is why if you're looking out on a parking lot on a dark night, you can see a guy standing in the corner of the parking lot. You can tell it's got the shape of a guy. It's got, it's got a hat on and a jacket on, but you can't really make out a detail until he steps and under a street light. So now you have all this information coming in with that light. And now you can see he's wearing an eagle's hat. He's wearing a brown colored jacket on. He's got a mustache, goatee. So the cones well, are for daylight. He's got a tattoo of a snake around his neck. Probably not a good guy. Oh, that's Sounds like a killer. That's actually my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> um, two questions. Yes. So when you're talking about the iris, or um, no, is the the iris you said expand and contract? The yeah. iris is what it's going to open and close. It's okay. Going to be a lot so when you that. say open and close, is this like? Um, like a muscle, like it's getting shorter, kind of or you. so it does get shorter and then bigger. Yeah. Okay. Um, and my other question is, um, I know a couple people who have this, who experience this, so I'm wondering, what is it when you um, step outside and your eyes like take a couple minutes? I want to say to dilate or something. Like you step from indoors and you go outside into the sunlight. And like I know a couple of people who like their eyes are bothered for a few minutes as they're adjusting, I guess, to yeah. the outdoor it, light. It's just the, the time it takes from the meiosis to go some constriction to now the activation of just these switches back there. If they're getting a bit overloaded, um, they're not going to be able to make much of a clear picture back here. Okay. Which is why it takes that little bit of a second or two, or a couple huh. of seconds, to really adjust. So the you know. When we talk about vision, where does vision take place? In the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe of the brain. But how does it take place back there? We don't know. <laughs> Light has to come in through here, through this, through this, get scattered back this way, hit those cells, which activates or doesn't activate them, which takes all that message and puts it in on the um, optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two, and sends it back to the brain to where it's actually interpreted. So some people just take so a long yes, yeah, somewhere in that it just takes a little bit longer. Yeah. Interesting. Now, I brought this up actually, it's about cranial nerve 2, CN2, cranial nerve 2. When we talked about that list of cranial nerves, they had Roman numerals and they had names. Yeah. This is called the optic nerve, which takes that information back to the brain. Um, you want to remember cranial nerve 2 is the optic nerve. And one way to do that, if you look up here, Roman numerals look like this, right? Mm -hmm. That's a one. Yes. That's two. So it looks like two eyes. <laughs> so the optic nerve, cranial nerve two, two eyes. You. Optic nerve, cranial nerve two, I two guess. eyes. She said, I guess. You got something better? Come on. That was Bring pretty it. good. You Bring think it. so? Bring it. Bring it. You think so? Yes. It's I pretty guess. awesome. I guess. You know what? When you get that right on the exam, you're going to be like, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think about it, yeah, it was pretty awesome. You did a great job with that one. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Then I give you your like props. Yeah, <laughs> All right, look at this. He goes into eyeballs separated. That's how we used to do our eyes and like, Two, look, two great. Yeah. Great, two, two great. Two, two great. <laughs> this is Loa Loa, the African island, making his way over. The what? Oh, the worm? Yeah. Stop it. Oh, yeah. I've seen it in our house. Oh, oh my God. It must be true. Look how the. He had a lot of. This is something interesting how vision comes in. This is the optic nerve right here, this whole thing. It's both, they have red and blue. They're just showing you different pathways here. 
So if this is the left eye and this is the right eye, this part of your left eye, which is like the sign near your nose, it takes that information and it sends it this way and crosses over and ends up on the left side of your occipital I think that's your dog. But this side of your left eye takes that information and stays on that side of the brain. And then the same thing happens with this eye. The reason that's important, not for you to know, just for us to know, what if someone had a stroke and part of their brain back here, like right here, was destroyed? I was going to ask that. So then they would say, my vision is fine except for this part of my right eye and this part of my left eye. Wait, this part of my left eye, this part of my right eye. So you can't see. Them. Wait, so they would have, what does that mean? So it'd be like this part, like looking yeah. at Brooke, and then it'd be like looking at um, Olivia. Yes, Olivia, Hello. we can see just fine. You say, Hello, Olivia. Hi. And she'd say, Hello. You, okay, you don't actually have to say hello no. back. I was just making an example, but since we're now in conversation, everything all right? How are you doing? You good? How okay. are you doing? You good? Um, <laughs> but then if we look over here, it would be more of nothing. You oh, if I'm this is looking at my, my left eye, my left eye, I wouldn't be able to see both of them. You wouldn't be able to see it at all, right? You'd be able to see eye, more here and that way. My right eye, I can't see. Now with my right eye, I can't see Olivia, but I can see Look, Brooke. If this right here is destroyed, <laughs> then all that information coming back here would go to nowhere. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Which means the only thing that would be functional would be parts of this. And all of this. Whatever you're seeing with the green, but what are you seeing with the green and what are you seeing with the red? Mm -hmm. You don't know? Yes. What do you it's mean? right there. Yeah. No, what do you mean? I mean like what visuals look, 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 at, look at the right eye. Are you oh are you talking about the peripheral vision? Yes. Okay, so everything you see with your sides. Wait, that's no. Get it. Look, all right, this is how it was. <laughs> so, all right, look straight. Look straight. Look straight. Look straight. That's confusing. Right. But your peripherals are the red on your right and the green on the left, so I don't get that. No, They're no, both no, the no. same. No, they no, both no. want the no, same. Stop, stop, stop. Listen. The information comes in the eye this way. These switches here get activated, and they send the message across to the other side of the brain over to here. These get activated and send a message to this side of the brain over to here. Right. But look at the angle it's coming So left to left, left right to right. Here. But he's saying, think about the left side, the right so, side. So yeah, so actually where Brooke is, you would be able to see better. Where Olivia is, you wouldn't be able to see if this part was destroyed. Yes, that's yes. But yes. I'm asking like visually, what is coming in on the, on the green and what is coming in on the red? Do you get my question? No. That's just, That's just the signal. The information is coming this way, <laughs> and it's here. Yep. Just so any old all information. these switches right here get activated. All right. And they send that information to the left. To here. here. Okay. Yep. So all the information going this way. All the information coming from the other eye hits this side. So it takes that information, crosses over this way, and goes to here. So I'm saying if part of this area or part of this area was destroyed, the information that's coming on this side would be able to be seen, which would mean Oh, so everything here. from that side wouldn't be seen or now everything. This part here would be able to see. You wouldn't be able to see from this side here, this stuff. Because look at the angle. It's coming yeah. like this. So it's coming from the outside in this way. All I want to do is show you a quick example of what is happening here. It's getting more and more it's confused. Amazing. Yeah, I feel like the more I look at it, the more confused I'm going to get. So, cool. Okay. The, the eye is the eye. Yes. Yeah. We'll go to the muscles of the eye. How about that? Uh, okay. Muscles of the eye. Which one is the one I call the head? Oh. Right? You'll okay. notice there are actually six muscles on each eyeball. Okay. And they attach directly to the sclera. One, two, three, four, five, five, one. Wait, what are you doing? Kind of yeah. You can only see five there, but there's actually six. In a minute. No, they're cut. Look. Here's an inferior oblique muscle. That's one. It comes in and attaches here. Here's a superior oblique muscle. It comes up around a little pulley and attaches over on the other side here. 
Then we have one, two, three, four of these other muscles. So there's two oblique and then four rectus muscles. You just can't see the other oblique muscle here. Oh, you can see this from here, right there. You just can't see it as the muscle, right there. So there's one, two, three, four rectus muscles. You see those? Yeah. Now, the nice thing about the rectus muscles is they're straight muscles because rectus means straight, straight. straight. So in their name, it tells you very simply where they're attached and in which direction they turn the eyeball. So the inferior rectus muscles attached to the bottom of the eyeball, so when it contracts, it pulls the eyeball this way. The superior rectus is attached to superiorly, so when it contracts, it pivots the eyeball upward, straight upward. The medial rectus is attached medially, so when it contracts, it's going to pivot the eyeball this medially toward towards your nose. Okay. And the lateral rect rectus is located laterally, so when it contracts, it's going to pivot the eyeball to the left. Wow. Now, the confusing part are the oblique muscles. Because even though the superior oblique muscle is attached way up here, it's located superiorly, when it contracts, it actually turns the eyeball down so you're looking at the tip of your nose. Oh. Which one is you say? Which one is that? Superior oblique. So the inferior oblique is going to do the opposite, sort of make you look up and away. Like to the top of your like the top corner. More like <laughs> but by having all these different muscles in our eyes, we can make our eyes move in all these different directions. So if I'm standing here, if I'm standing here and I want to look at the podium, my right lateral, lateral rectus pulls my eyeball this way, my left medial rectus pulls my eyeball this way. Mm. You see how that works? I do. That I understand. <laughs> that one's simple. That one's simple. So you said the oblique are the uh diagonal. Yeah, all right. Hmm. Boy. He said boy. <laughs> 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 okay. How you spell diagonal? D I A. Diagonal. Now, all right, I got it, man. It's been a while. It's been a while. Huh? And it's If you look, if you look right here, disc. Um, this is actually we call it the blind spot because there's no. Right, and there's, there's none of those cells that are there, those little switches. So any light that comes in there, it doesn't hit anything. So it creates a little blind spot. Like the car, like this the case right here. Leaves. But that um, blind spot, we don't notice it? No, your brain fills in the space. So. Thought so. But if it didn't fill in the space, would it just be like a blank spot in our yep. vision? Interesting. Yeah. Just you said what's the blind spot? Hold on. This is where the optic disc is. This is where the optic nerve takes all that information out of the eyeball back into the brain. Hmm. So there's no retina there, so there's none of those cells that can make the switches. It should be no retina. Yeah, it should be no retina. I'm out. Wow, oh my gosh, oh. let's go by so fast. Oh. Or it's called the oracle. Uh, when you think of an ear, you said to somebody, point to your ear, grab your ear. When they grab, that's basically the oracle or the pinna. The helix is the curved area here that extends all the way down, almost to the lobe. And of course, the lobe is the lobe. Are you still talking about the, out, the outer, outer ear, part? The outer ear, yeah. Okay. The outer ear. The tragus is this little part right here. That's the part that we sometimes get pierced. Oh, that's right, flat yeah. That sits in front. Gotcha. Not terribly noteworthy. Um, you can see the internal auditory canal. I'm sorry, excuse me, the external auditory canal going backwards. The external auditory canal and the auditory meatus or external auditory meatus. The word meatus, M E A T U S, uh, that just means an opening. So you will see that again. You'll hear me say it again. So meatus. Just get used to me saying meatus. Me it looks like meatus, M-E-A-T-U-S. If you saw it, you'd just pronounce it meatus. 
M E A T U S, like meat. Us. Oh. But it's pronounced Meatus. Meatus at the door. Right. Meatus at the opening. There you go. Huh. I like that. Sure. Um, then we see, of course, the tympanic membrane, also with the eardrum, the three smallest bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, sometimes called the ossicles of the articular chain. Here, this whole thing right here, kind of like a light blue color, that is called the labyrinth. That's in the inner ear. Is that what we saw the squirrely thing on the other one? This, here? yes, the cochlea is what we saw the squirrely thing. The vestibule is right here, and the semicircular canals. You kind of have to imagine these little things in these tubes in three dimensions, sort of sticking out in different directions. And inside of each of these tubes, there's a jelly-like fluid, and there's these little tiny filaments. So as you tilt your head one way or the other. The fluid is going to fall in that tube, it's going to drain down the tube, it's going to activate those little filaments, and that sends a signal to your cerebellum, tells you which way you're facing, or you're upside down. Oh or whatever. my gosh, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. That's what people say if they have an so does, does it, does it can cause them to have a little bit of vertigo. So is it, that feeling of motion when you're standing still. Did everyone sign in? Okay. So the fluid, even in this outside movement? Just by gravity. Okay. So, imagine these tubes sort of sticking out in these different directions, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, they're tubes, so they're going like this, and they're going like this, and they're going like this. So as you tilt your head this way, it drains this way, so it drains this way. Oh, uh, uh, I was just about to say, so but it's still the little tube connected to the level. No. Like a level. Yeah. Can you use a level? Yeah. The mercury in it? Not mercury, just water with a little air bubble. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was mercury. Yeah. And then it moves. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, when the fluid moves, there's these little filaments. And then they're having your fluid moving on them or not moving on them. And that information, those filaments moving, sends a signal back to the brain that says, we're at a 45 degree angle. Yeah, remember the cerebellum, that part of the bottom back part of the brain? It has to do with posture. Hmm. Then you can see the Eustachian tube there, spelled with an E U S T A C I C H I A N, Eustachian. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Eustachian. Eustachian. Vestibular cochlear nerve? Yeah, vestibular cochlear nerve, that's creating on nerve eight. Also known as the auditory nerve, okay. vestibular cochlear, cranial nerve eight. The way somebody once told me uh, that they remembered it is that it's cranial nerve eight, and eight begins with an E, and yeah. ear begins with an E. So that's how they remembered that it had something to do with the ear. Um, so those nerves just help. The like what has when do they come into play? The vestibular cochlear nerves? Yeah. All of those little filaments that's in the cochlea, the curly Q thing. Yeah. When sound comes in, it causes those things that are like this. All that information of those little things going like this is collected and sent along the vestibular cochlear nerve to the temporal lobe okay. of the brain. Now and my, then that information eventually makes it to your frontal lobe, where you're now understanding the words that are coming from my face. So, um, in the cochlea, mm -hmm. in the video that you were playing earlier, the um, sound waves were bouncing and kind of like going through the the walls, quote unquote, instead of going all the way down the cochlea and going around that way. Why are they taking a shortcut through those walls and how can they do that? You know, instead of bouncing all the way through, even the long waves were cutting through at the end versus going all the way around. Just from vibration. So, but. I don't know why we wouldn't follow the the, uh, the straight path. I mean, even though it's curly, it was the straight yeah, path. Yeah, it's like it's it's straight less. Straight would, would require it to have to transfer through, which means something's going to be lost in it. But I would think that's the only way it would be going through is from vibration. But I think for the most part, it does kind of follow the curly Q around. I don't know why they showed the video. Like yeah, that. like when I in the video, it didn't show any of them going fully around. It said the short waves will stop here and then go through and then come back down, and then the long waves will go up here and shoot through and around. Uh, but none of them went fully. Like this is just nothing else. The sound waves through the cochlea. The curly Q snail part. Hmm. 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 You got him.
You know bluff room means either, right? Yes, that is correct. Uh, ectropia and entropia, and this one either is turned one way or the other. You move it outwards. Don't what? worry about it. As you get older, either it's kind of just sometimes oh, right. like this, or sometimes they'll pull this way. Yeah. So don't worry about that one. Forty old, you should know about that. Forty old. Forty old is a sty. Oh. Ah, okay. A forty old is a sty. That's pretty oh, common, right? Hey, what's that's pretty common. Common. <laughs> yes. oh, it over. is D D volume for you. It is a staph infection. Why? Because it's an infection of the skin. And we know that if there's an infection of the skin, most commonly it's going to be caused by staph. Mm. Also known as a sty. Stay sty. Sty stay. Stop it. <laughs> so, 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 oh God! I've never heard that one. I've never heard one compression. That's about it. A warm compression. What you about to do? I was saying, you're ready. He's ready. I told you I have the 1,000 home remedies in my bathroom. Only because. I get so many questions about styes and treatments of styes. That's a whole section of it. It's almost a whole section. It really is. Uh, first of all, you do not get a sty from looking up at the stars. Uh, you do not get a sty from denying a pregnant woman food. That was a question. You do not treat a sty with baby urine. You do not treat a sty by peeing on a rag and then putting the rag on your face. You do not treat a sty with horse urine. What? First of all, like, how do you even collect horse urine? I would run around with a bucket, I would assume, and just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. It's my show. <laughs> well, <laughs> what? Seriously, it sounds like a horse. Um, so, no, and then again, breast milk. No. I've never, that's crazy. Now, since it is just a skin infection, remember the, the eyelid skin is the thinnest skin on the body. So it doesn't take much to get a little bit of an abrasion there. And then you get a little bit of staph in it and it creates a little infection. Most of the time, a warm, moist compress is all that's required. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we might have to give an antibiotic. Sometimes you actually have to drain it give an antibiotic. But most of the time, not. Most of the time, you put a warm, moist compress. Now, somebody has asked in the past, how about a tea bag? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I've had a tea bag. Well, well, the thing about a tea bag is you put it in boiling water, you take it out, it's a warm, moist compress that happens to fit the eye. It's about the right size. There's no medicinal value to it in the tea. Uh, you do get a nice cup of tea, though, so you can sit there while you're drinking your tea with a bag on your face. But... The, the, the tea itself is not going to fix anything. It's the warm moisture that and brings a lot it of it. It's going to vasodilate the blood vessels. The solution to pollution is, that is dilution. So we're going to vasodilate the blood vessels, bring a lot of extra blood there, which means bring a lot of extra white blood cells, flush away a lot of extra garbage, and help to clean it up quickly. Hmm. Uh, conjunctivitis, we talked a little bit about this. Inflammation in the conjunctiva, usually due to infection. Now, most of the time, it's either bacterial or viral. And in old school, we would say a bacterial, contagious bacterial conjunctivitis is caused by um, some bacterium, and that's what we would call pink eye. And if it was viral conjunctivitis, we would call it viral conjunctivitis. So pink eye was just for the bacterial conjunctivitis. Viral conjunctivitis was viral conjunctivitis. However, now people use it to, to, to find either one, which is fine. How would you know the difference? Well, uh, first of all, the, the bacterial one is going to have a lot more purulent discharge. The viral one is usually less, uh, less severe, much more mild. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about this is, even if a kid's got this viral conjunctivitis, we're still going to give them an antibiotic. And the reason for that is because it's a viral. Mm -hmm. That antibiotic's not going to help at all. But it's going to cause a lot of itching and watering to this kid's eyes. So what's he going to do? Itch it. He's going to rub it. 
And as he rubs it, he's going to introduce a whole lot of bacteria into that eye, which is now going to cause a bacterial infection, bacterial conjunctivitis. So it's very, very common for that pediatrician to give a back, an antibiotic for a viral conjunctivitis because, yeah, it's probably going to become bacterial because he's probably going to infect it. And, of course, because the eyes are connected to the nose and the nose is connected to the eyes, if it's in this eye, it's going to end up in this eye. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, doesn't have to be touch it here and touch it there and now it's infected, although that's usually what happens. But it can just go from this eye to this eye if it's infectious. You'll see people with allergic conjunctivitis as a result of touching something like a dog or a cat and then rubbing their eye. Well, if they only rub the one eye, it's not going to spread to the other one. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Exophthalmus, uh, pronounced bulging in the eyes. We will, yeah, we will see this uh, later on this week. So listen to it now, because uh, you'll see it again. Commonly associated with a type of hyperthyroidism called Graves' disease, where the eyes are sort of bulging. I mean, they're not popping out of the head, but you can see white all around this, all around the iris. It's like a surprise look. Sclero icterus, unconjugated bilirubin, depositing in the areas like the conjunctiva, makes the whites of the eyes look yellow, usually associated with the liver not doing its job. We talked about glaucoma. How do we treat glaucoma? Wow, that was fast. <laughs> Didn't even hesitate on that one. Marijuana. You don't got glaucomas on the Marijuana. I didn't actually not know that. Yeah. There's that marijuana is it's, it's really approved, FDA approved for the treatment of two things. Cancer. No. You can't treat cancer with marijuana. Cancer. It's a pain reliever. Yeah. Anorexia as a result of treatment for cancer. So when people have cancer, we give them medication like chemotherapeutic agents, chemotherapy. The chemotherapy causes the anorexia. So to treat the anorexia, medical marijuana is approved for that. And it's also approved for glaucoma. Huh. It's not approved for those other things like it's written for. But we can write things off label as I described before, like with Benadryl. If we wanted to, we could write Benadryl as a sleep aid. Right? Even though it's really just for allergic reactions, that's what it's FDA approved for. But we know what the side effect is. We know drowsiness, and technically, it can be written what we call off-label. Mm -hmm. So you could write marijuana for sleep as well? Oh, they write it for everything. Wow. They write it for back pain, anxiety, depression. Yeah, I've heard of that. don't have any marijuana. <laughs> so they write it for everything. Where you sleep? Yeah. <laughs> Around me, there's one. On. I know that they can put one in the center city. I know that's cool. Yeah, you have to have a, a medical card somewhere. Medical. Right? Huh. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, and, and I, I don't think you are, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> so, can I do this for like my adult right here? <laughs> You could probably get it for a bunion on your foot at this point. They would probably prescribe really? it for anything. But, but realize, um, I don't know if I would be an investor in a place like that. Because first of all, they can't take credit cards. I heard the you can't, you, can't pay, you, can't, you can't pay in a dispensary for marijuana. For Pulls up on your credit card list like, like, oh, no, this person it, shopped here. That's true. It's because marijuana federally is still illegal. Yeah. And all banks are federally um, secured. So the banks have to follow the laws of the federal government. I and see. The <coughs> banks are the ones that issue credit cards. Each individual. So <coughs> if there's a bank outside of the United States that wants to issue a credit card, or if you want to start your own bank that said, well, we don't care if we're not federally secured by the government, which would be a terrible idea. Um, but I don't know if I want to invest in it anyway because it's only a matter of time before it's legal. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's not, if it's not going to be legal in all fifty states, it's going to be legal in a lot of states. Is it already legal in a lot of states? Well, I mean, for recreational use. Yeah. Oh, for recreational. You know, you, you have to realize that marijuana was legal in the United States in the early nineteen hundreds. It was completely legal. 
And then one state banned it. What state was the first state to ban marijuana? Oh. California. They were the first ones. They were the first ones to ban it, and then uh, every, all the other states started to follow, and then it became a federal law. And it's ironic that they were also one of the first ones to make it legal, like for recreational use, yeah, or for medical first and recreation. Um, so a lot of states do uh, follow California. So what California does, other states often follow. So, there we go. So it's only a matter of time, even if Pennsylvania never gets recreational legal marijuana, um, Delaware will, you know, or New Jersey York will, will, or Jersey will. So it, it's, it's going to be legal enough in a few years. Uh, but understand, people get really excited at that notion, oh, marijuana's going to be legal. But you still can't get high before school. You still can't get yeah. high before you go to work. Just like vodka is legal, yeah, like you but you can't get drunk before you go to work. You can't take a break at work and get drunk. I, I know there is. Well, that, yeah. Is that wrong for them to do drug testings in school? I mean, um, jobs for marijuana, is this going to be legal? I was actually going to ask that. Yeah, uh, can you not again, the, they're developing, they're developing tests right now that have to do with um, being able to recognize marijuana if it's been taken in in some way, one form or the other, recently, as compared to a couple of days or 30 days. Would it be the levels of no. I don't think I don't think so, but I don't know for sure, because I know it's relatively yeah. new. But um, That's interesting. there's already hospitals have no smoking policies, no tobacco policies. Yeah, so weird. you can't work at a hospital if you use any kind of tobacco, and they test you for that before you start. You can't get life insurance. I was saying, I know a friend. Like, yeah, well, they don't employ you because they don't want to insure it. So yeah, that's that's the reason why they make entire. For tobacco. Yeah, that's the reason why they make entire um, like hospital system to entirely tobacco free because it brings the cost down mm -hmm. of the healthcare benefits of employees. So it doesn't cost them as much in health care benefits. And I get that. I, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. Um, but, but the same thing is going to be with drugs, with marijuana, with alcohol. So they'll, they'll come up with tests that they can do on the spot to see if a person is actually under the influence of it rather than at that time. three days ago. Right. Interesting. Damn. That's it. That's crazy. Don't smoke. Because I, I've always thought that if, even before it was any kind of legal in the United States, I thought, what if you travel to Amsterdam? The and you're there, and you're there for a week and you smoke something that while you're there, and then you come back and your work tests you. I always thought that there should be an exemption of. They said you if you have your passport them. right here that says that you were here yeah. during this time, oh, and yeah. they test uh -huh. you again. You know, oh, six you weeks later. Yeah, I was company. told you all for it. Yeah. Okay, so this is it's a company that does, like, they, they do all the background checks. They do the drug testing for most of the security, most of federal security. So they have a chart that can tell if you just breathe in, like, if you oh, were really? sitting around somewhere, okay. did it, or how long hmm. you, it took for you to smoke. Um, they have a, a, a real good chart. There are ones, burglars, Uh Cataracts, have you heard of these? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. This actually has to do with the lens in your eye. It starts to become cloudy. Yeah. Uh, and you can see this more common in aging patients and smokers. And I've even bold print and sort of underlined this part here. The patient will say it's like looking through wax paper. So that's a statement that's, um, you can almost make a diagnosis over the phone. You get a seven year old smoker who calls in and says, My vision's like looking through wax paper. You kind of know what the problem is. Have you heard of color blindness? Yeah. So intriguing. I don't know why that intrigued me so much. Yeah. Um, the Ishihara test. Oh, right. Yeah. is a test for color blindness. Mm -hmm. So what they'll do is they'll put up, they'll, they'll show you a picture of a bunch of little dots, and the dots will be in one color, and then there'll be a contrast in color that will either have a shape or a letter 
or a number, in this case the number 57. And if you didn't see that number, that means you're colorblind. You're so. You are messing with me. 12. In this case, it's 57. Yeah. That's a good it's question. Common. Yes. Yeah. I heard women are usually not colorblind. That's a good yeah. question because yeah. sometimes people go as far as to say that women can't be colorblind, it's only in men. No, but that's not true. Uh, it's just much, much, much less likely in women and it's much less severe. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to whether it's something that has to do with the X chromosome or not. Because remember, guys only have one X chromosome. If the directions on there are messed up, uh, then they're just the only copy they have, we have. But uh, women have two X chromosomes, so if they have one bad copy of something, they usually have one good copy of it, a backup copy. Uh, retinoblastoma, this is something your pediatrician checks your kids for. Uh, this is a tumor in their eye. This is bad news, but I mean, if you catch it early, it could possibly save the eye. Uh, nystagmus, involuntary rhythmic beats of the eye when looking to one side. The police do this when they pull you over. <laughs> they say, follow the pen with your eyes, not with your hand. Just with your eyes, and they'll make you look from side to side. When they pull the pen right over this way, your eyes will sort of have this. Mm -hmm. Rhythmic beat to it that you can't control. So you can't like go I'm trying to control it. It'll make this. And what is that? Like, that's nystagmus, uh, and that is that could be the result of uh, intoxication or brain injury. Oh, I was gonna say, why would they do that? So they're looking. That tells them that they're intoxicated. Can that be a excuse? Yeah, we sort of prove it. Oh, it's, sometimes like we don't even. It's justifiable, and understand that field sobriety test is just a test. It's not a confirmation. Mm -hmm. So there has to be something else that goes along with it, either like a breathalyzer or a blood test. Mm -hmm. But it's enough to give probable cause to look for those things. Hmm. And sometimes they will turn it head, like you just say, move your eyes, and they turn it head, like, what are you doing? It's not paying attention to the direction. Or they'll say things like, I can't even do this when I'm sober. That's how you know. All right, you jump in. That's how you know. <laughs> What are these two? I have no idea what this is. Oh, it's uh, strabismus. Deviation of one eye looking from looking to the side or to the nose. So like cross eye. Oh, cross eye. Esotropia is wall -eye. cross what eye. Exotropia is wall eye. It's wall eye. It's wall -eye. Like this. Yeah. Except it doesn't have to be both. It can just be one. Oh, the cross eye is this coming inward. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm standing here and I'm looking straight back here, my one eye is looking this way, my other eye is going off here. That's exotropic. Or I'm looking this way, my other eye is going this way. Esotropic. Cross eye. Exo leaving. So. Yeah. So. Okay. The thing is, if I'm looking down here and I want to look down here, if I want to look over here. And my other eye is going off this way. <laughs> the brain is going to ignore what's coming in this eye. That says, I don't want to look over here. Because I'm looking, I'm looking at here. My attention is to look That's here. So the brain just out. ignores this information. So oh, That's the like, lazy eye. People talk about um, a person having a lazy eye. That's not the, it's not a lazy eye. <laughs> it's the amblyopia. That is the brain ignoring what's coming in that eye. It has nothing to do with the eye lid. That's why it's called lazy. Right. Got it. But it's actually the brain. It should be called lazy brain. Because the brain's so like, is the what? I don't want anything to do with that. So this is corrected either surgically, where they can move the other eye in line, or uh, they can put a patch on the good eye and force the other eye to sort of go to where it needs to go. And in fact, even if they do the surgery, they usually have to patch the good eye anyway. Because even if you do the surgery and correct the, uh, the eyes, this eye will still be taken, will still ignore what's coming in. So you put a patch on this eye, so it forces that eye to accept the information. Therefore, it forces the brain to accept that information. Wait, so when, in other, in other instances when children, um, like my sister, for example, had, a, had to use a patch when she was younger, um, to correct her other eye because the one eye was worse off than the other. How does that balance it out? Or how does that correct the... The, the muscles. Because remember we have those six muscles. 
Yeah. We've talked about balancing the eye out or balancing the brain out. Balancing her vision. Like it was just because this eye was worse off. Like it's never gone off into a separate direction. But it was something about balancing like her vision. Then it may have just been about balancing the, the way the brain interprets it. That's all. Mm. But I, I, I'm not ophthalmologist. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know why they would do it just to correct a vision problem. Mm. It, how old was she? She was um, been young. Yeah, she was no more than six. I yeah. don't think. So. I, it was, you know, as far back as I can remember. Yeah, you would do that on fourteen. Yeah, interesting. I, but again, that I don't know if they do that to try to correct a, a nailer vision problem. Mm -hmm. uh, astigmatism. Have you heard of this? Yep, this I have is, it. Oh, what? I have, I have astigmatism. I have one. Well, what? Yeah. This is really dangerous. Yeah. What? No, it isn't. Stop playing with um, me. It's, it's very, 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 very common. The reason for that is because I told you that the cornea is sort of that bulging part, and then the rest of the eye sort of goes like this. Yeah. This angle right here, where the cornea meets the sclera, is even all the way around. If in some areas it comes in at too steep of an angle, like this, or not steep enough of an angle like this, that's going to change the way that light comes through here. Yeah, they definitely said my eyes look a little shape. <laughs> well, the reality is, if we looked close enough, most of us would probably have some form of astigmatism. Okay. Because we're human. So if you look at the whole eyeball, there's there's a, probably a little bit of deviation in, in most of us. And that brings me to, because the way to correct this is simply with lenses. You put a lens in front of it, and what the lens does is it redirects the light coming through. So as the light comes through, instead of coming through this way, maybe the light comes through this way more. So that when it hits this, it comes in straight again. It but, just redirects that. But why do lenses not, this, it's probably gonna be that answer, but why do lenses or any sort of corrective vision um, not fully get you to see as well as somebody who's quote unquote 20, 20. Well, like I'll be, ne I'll be right next to my friend because, driving down the road, and I, they could see a, a sign that's a whole mile down the road, and yeah, I still can't see it. But first of all, what is twenty twenty? Perfect vision? No, there's no such thing as perfect vision. Oh, okay. I know people often think that, but twenty twenty is not perfect vision. Twenty twenty is average vision. Okay. It's what an average person. It's a line on that Snellen chart. Like the Snellen chart is the chart of the E and then a bunch of letters. Mm -hmm. It's the line on the Snellen chart that a person can read from twenty feet away. That's average. Okay. That's why some people you hear of somebody having a fifteen twenty vision. Oh, is that better? Yeah. So the smaller the number, the better. Yeah. Okay. So how could some if, if twenty twenty was better? How could something better be? How could something be better, better, be better. than perfect? Yeah. yeah. If twenty twenty was perfect, then you couldn't have better than perfect. Gotcha. So twenty twenty isn't actually perfect. So even so, it helps it's just sort of arbitrary. Like on the twenty-ish. It's yeah, it brings you closer to that number. Gotcha. That's all. Okay. Uh, hyperopia. They, sometimes the books don't have so much information with this stuff. It's very simple. Hyper, hyperopia is farsightedness. So the patient reads the menu like this. It's also called old person disease. <laughs> old person disease? Yeah, this, well, this is how I write, read the menu like this. Okay. And then nearsightedness. Ah, oh, now I see it. <laughs> That's the only difference, myopia. So myopia. They, they go into a lot more detail. They go into a lot more detail. For this level, unless you're going to be an ophthalmologist, you really don't need to know more than that. Uh, diplopia, double vision. What that means is when you're looking at me, two. you see two of me. How lucky are you? Not that lucky. Stop it. Who am I punching? Yeah, wait, what? <laughs> the one in the middle. She said, I don't know. Which one of y'all hit me? <laughs> <laughs> Which one of y'all hit me? <laughs> oh, gosh. Mm. All right. Get it all down there, turtle one. A scutoma. Scotoma is a defect in the field of vision. It's not an actual mass or anything in the field of vision. It's as if there was something in the red way. And the one that you feel about here a lot more is a scintillating scotoma. That's these flashing bright lights. Oftentimes you'll see that like right before a migraine headache. Yeah, I've heard people saying that. 
Interesting. Oh, here's a fun one. Uh, the mentum is another name for the chin. Mentum. And there's are the nostrils. The nasal ala, that's that side of the nose that gets pierced sometimes. Women pierce that part. Okay. Nasal labial fold is that line that comes down from the nose to the mouth. And the philtrum, that vertical groove above the lip. Remember, this is where your face grew together. Oh, no. Oh, this part. Clap, the clap part. Well, well if it wasn't together, yeah. it would be clap. Right uh, the nasal cavity, you know, is lined with mucosa. Um, there are these turbinates or conchi that are in it. We'll see that in the respiratory section. It helps to warm air and trap particles and add moisture. The oral cavity, obviously in the mouth, most people don't realize the oral cavity is also lined with mucosa. Trap warm particles. Well, saliva? Not just saliva, actual mucus. Mm. <coughs> Mixed in with saliva? Yeah, but think of that. Right. Next time you come close to a person and they want to kiss you, you're like, I don't want your mucus in my mouth. Ew. Ew. Oh. Oh. I'm going to kiss a lot of people. They're good, don't. They're horrible. Um, they open your mouth, say that you come and say, ah. Ah. Uh, open uh, uh, the ah. Now you'll see here the uvula. The uvula yeah. is a little hanging down punching bag. This is what initiates the gag reflex. The oropharynx is this space. Pharynx is the throat. It's divided into three parts. The oropharynx is right here. If you stuck a dental mirror back here and flipped it so you looked up, the nasal pharynx is behind this. If you flipped it down, the laryngopharynx is behind this. So the throat is three parts. This surprises people because most of the time, if you ask them to point to your throat, they would point to this area right here. Oh, no. Well, that's actually wrong. It's quite a bit above that. It's way up here. The throat is much higher than people realize. Hmm. Uh, in this picture, it's nice because they show the palatine tonsils. The adenoids are up and above here. You can't quite see them. But the palatine tonsils are the uh, tonsils that people get taken out when they say they have the tonsils yeah. taken out. Oh, okay. That's what it is. Yes, both, they, do they take out both sides or oh, yeah. one side? Both sides. Okay. Typically, yeah, they'll take out both sides. They'll, they'll usually take like adenoids with them. So what is it? Do they split it? Because is that like a... No, this is a part here. This is a part here. You just loop around it with a piece of wire and slice. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, or that sometimes sense. you can just get a, like an old rusty fishing knife. Okay. It's just like this. Okay. It takes a little more time though. Mm -hmm. A little more muscle. Hold on, be done in a few minutes. Uh, Almost finished. We're that's what they used to do when they cut people's leg off back in the day. Yeah. Just hold on. You cut my leg, it hurts. Cut your leg, it hurts. They just keep doing it. Okay. Laryngeal prominence. Remember, if you look at Pat over here. Drive by the knife. <laughs> light blue right here. This is the laryngeal cartilage. Some people call this the thyroid cartilage. I like to call it the laryngeal cartilage because it surrounds the larynx. This right here, the pointed part, is the laryngeal prominence. That's the Adam's apple. Everybody has this. And what's it called again? Laryngeal. Laryngeal prominence. The laryngeal prominence. Laryngeal prominence. The laryngeal prominence. The larynx is the voice box. Right behind them. That's where we find the true vocal cords. Um. Uh, now you know if you swallow something, you want to go down the food tube and not the air tube. Mm -hmm. And there is a little lid-like structure called the epiglottis that flips over into place. So that when you swallow something, the food stuff goes down the food tube, which is the esophagus, that's posterior to the air tube, which is the larynx and the trachea. I mean, just can this one with an interview? That's why they say, like, it went down the wrong pipe when they yeah. start coughing. No, you had a 50 50 chance. Uh, can you show a picture of what that looks like on the inside? <laughs> uh, okay. You know what? Let me show it. Let's see if I can find cool. a animated view. Yeah, something like that. Because it might be a little difficult to see it. Okay. Because I can show it to you. In fact, let me show you right now. Um, the part is the part not working at all today. Correct. Okay, so this cartilage right here, 
that's the Adam's apple, that's the laryngeal cartilage mm -hmm. surrounding this. This is the epiglottis, it's a little wood like structure. Okay, so just that's the blue, that's the blue thing that you just said about. Yes. Well, no, the, the cartilage here is the blue thing. The epiglottis you can't see. If you look here, real quick, here's that um, laryngeal cartilage. This is the light blue stuff. Oh, nice. And you can see the hyoid bone right above it. Remember the hyoid bone? Yes. What do you know about the hyoid bone? It floats. It just on. Floats. Everybody it's floats down here. Bone in your body. Bone in your body. Like Pennywise. Just come in there. Just go to Cryford with that. You cut through that. You can do an emergency airway. What about all this? Right here. You're looking for the holes. This is your tongue. Ew! Your, your tongue is, your tongue is huge. Um, it's most beautiful. people don't realize how big and ugly their tongue is. Yeah, but it's pretty big. Mm. This right here, <laughs> this area right here is the throat, okay? So oh, the throat I see. ends right about here. Like right here. Just below your chin. This is all the larynx. Because this is larynx here. Okay. <laughs> and then this is trachea. Not this, but this. <laughs> so where is it choosing food or liquid? You swallow, you <laughs> swallow, I'm sorry, you swallow, and this is the food too. That's oh. the food, I guess that was the liquid. Oh goodness. Why is it so smaller than the liquid tube? That's what I'm wondering. Hey, what liquid tube are you talking about? This is an air tube. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, oh it's an oh. air. Shh. What are you talking to? Oh, you messed up my presentation tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the food too. Okay. Food and liquid too. Food and this liquid? The, yes. Food and liquid goes down this tube. Oh. That goes to the stomach. That's the esophagus. Well, then how are you going to say it's a... This is the air tube. So when you swallow something, there's something we there's don't want it to go here. So the epiglottis flips over. And then now the food and liquids go down through here. Into okay. your stomach. Okay. Oh. So you don't choke and die. But sometimes you said that that liquid, whatever that word is, is not fast enough that you choke. Sometimes. It's not fast enough to close. Oh, especially if you're trying to breathe at the same time. Like, <gasps> No, that happens when you're talking. You can't breathe and talking, swallow at the same talking, time. Take, People. As you're talking, you take a breath. breath. As you take a breath, mm -hmm. you're swallowing. Oh, oh yeah. Then interesting. And then you die. Or you just <laughs> so leave. very interesting. And then no one wants to be your friend. Because nobody wants to be friends with the person who choked to death on a piece of cheeseburger at McDonald's. Be your friend. The only friend that I have is friend is. They'll make fun of you and shut them up. Shut them up. I like you. <laughs> I'm like, what? I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> How was that when you thought of? Oh, you thought of Cheddar Bob. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, I'm still there. Did you see these right here? Oh, what's that on? These are the vocal cords. Oh, okay. They're there when they're open. Interesting. Oh. So, as you talk, air comes through here. Listen to this. I'll teach you something. As you talk, air comes through here. It causes these to vibrate. And that's what makes the sound of words coming from my face. However, if we change the type of air that came through here, made it an air that moved faster. As the air moved faster, these would vibrate differently, which would change the sound of my voice. So if so somebody inhales helium from a helium balloon and then speaks and they sound like a chipmunk, that's why, because the helium moves faster. So it causes them to vibrate faster. It causes a different funny. sound to come through. What about people who can beatbox? I've seen like the inside of their throat when they're doing that and they just be weirded. They're, you know what, they're on the nose. The what? Don't, don't be friends with them. What Nobody they likes them here. Yeah. Uh, they're a whole other breed is what they are. They can kill it. 
<laughs> and they, yeah, they can really like make some sounds. <laughs> I'm sorry, I started a whole chain reaction. Yeah, you realize how much that's pissing off. <laughs> she doesn't like chew sound, let alone any other sound. <laughs> Alright, when you do leave this classroom, um, you leave this classroom, you leave this classroom.